going to miss Boyd's over-caffeinated, way too tired lecture on the War of 1812. Thank you so much for joining me. So first things first, the War of 1812 is going to last from 1812 until about 1815. What we see come out of this war um, is much more of a sense of American patriotism and pride and sovereignty than anything else like territory changing hands. Um, this war really is the American Revolution part two for that reason. It's going to create a lot of patriotism, sense of national pride, sense of national identity more than anything else. So what are some causes for the War of 1812? First of all, we've still got Britain practicing impressment against American soldiers. That's going to cause a lot of tensions. It's been causing tensions, and it will continue to cause tensions here that play into the conflict before the War of 1812. We've also got violations of sovereignty. America feels like it's being disrespected by Britain. America feels like Britain is not respecting our rights as a full-fledged nation. Um, the example that I would use is, okay, so I'm 27 years old. If I go home to visit, and my mom is like, all right, Jordan, you know, it's 9 p.m., it's time to go to bed. I'm going to look at her like, mom, I'm an adult, like, you can't tell me what to do anymore. And so America feels like its sovereignty has been violated in a similar fashion. We're grown up. We are our own nation. We fought a war to get away from you. And this is how you're going to treat us. One example of that violation of sovereignty would be the orders in council that were passed a few years prior to this war. Orders in council saying that American ships had to stop at British ports before they went anywhere else. Um, in the context of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain thought that they had good reason to have us, um, you know, stop there, make sure we weren't giving belligerents any weapons. But in America's eyes, we're a full-fledged nation now. Don't violate our sovereignty. You can't tell our ships where they will and will not go. Um, violation of sovereignty would also maybe come to play a little bit with impressment to leave our citizens alone. Um, one final cause is going to be territorial hunger. Americans are going to be hungry for territory out west that is held by Native Americans. We're also going to have our eye on Spanish Florida and parts of Canada. And so territorial hunger is going to be a really, really big key factor. It's also useful to keep in mind that right now, Britain is at war with France, particularly with this dude right here. His effects are much larger than he, Napoleon. Um, fun fact, Napoleon was probably 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, That's about as tall as me. He's not really that short. I don't... I think his enemies helped to popularize the idea of him being like a diminutive person, but that's really neither here nor there. Um, in any case, this war with Napoleon is fueling this British demand for American sailors. Um, it's also sort of dividing British forces during the majority of the War of 1812. And ultimately, when Napoleon is defeated by the British, the British are going to want peace toward the end of this. But we'll get there here in a few minutes. So let's see. The first thing that I would like to do is talk a little bit more over here about territorial hunger. Territorial hunger is going to refer again to this big conflict with Native Americans that's begun. I'm going to flip to over here, perhaps, where you can't see my, my greasy face. So, let's see. A couple Native Americans who you should probably know. We've got Tecumseh, we've got Tenskwatawa, a.k.a. Prophet. So, Tecumseh is going to be an early Native American leader. He's, of course, going to be allied with the British. The British and Native Americans um, are working pretty closely at this point in time. Um, the British have promised time and time again that they're going to stop supplying Native Americans, they're going to stop having a presence over here, and they really have not followed through on any of those treaties. And so Native Americans who see conflict with the colonists on the horizon have also been cultivating those relationships, and Tecumseh is one of them. His brother Tenskwatawa is going to give what your textbook calls more of a um, religious element or a philosophical perhaps element, um, almost a mystical element to resistance against white encroachment. And Tenskwatawa is going to urge, you know, a repudiation like refuse white ways, try to return to um, uh, Native American life ways, and life is going to be better for you for that. And so Tenskwatawa is going to kind of bring a different dimension to it, and he's going to help get a lot more followers for the Native American cause. In the 1790s, the Western Confeder Confederation had been formed. Um, the Western Confederation was just a group of Native Americans out west, you probably could have guessed that, um, who were banding together in order to resist white encroachment, white colonial encroachment. The Western Confederation is revived um, by Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa right here prior to the War of 1812. And in 1811, um, the Battle of Tippecanoe is going to happen. Um, Tippecanoe is going to be a huge Native American loss. Um, John Tyler, a.k.a. Tippecanoe, that becomes his nickname, he leads troops against Native Americans, and Tippecanoe ends up being a battle, you know, prior to the War of 1812. That's a big Native American loss. Um, but this just goes to show, you know, this conflict really is, um, it has multiple dimensions to it, and territorial hunger is going to be a big impact, or a big, excuse me, a big factor, not impact. Um, we're going to see Tyler again resurface in 1840. 
Um, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too will be a campaign slogan that we see here in a little bit. So. To continue just a tiny bit with Native Americans, um, just because we're already over here, um, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend is going to be a big, huge battle that we see during the War of 1812 after it's declared. Um, I have $20 over here. Can you guess why? Okay, now it's awkward. I'm sorry. I don't know how to pause like I don't know where it says. Um, but Andrew Jackson is going to be leading forces against Native Americans at Horseshoe Bend. He's actually able to play one Native American group off of another, and this is going to be a huge key colonial, or not colonial, oh my goodness, we're way past that point in time, a huge key American victory um, against Native Americans. And so people who advocate for war and really want to go carry on the war with these territorial goals are called war hawks. Some prominent early war hawks include Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, and we'll come back to both of those names as the 1800s wears on. So the big thing to keep in mind here with conflict with Native Americans during the War of 1812 is that as with really any conflict at this point in time, they're going to come out as the ultimate losers of the war, unfortunately. Um, they're not going to have a lot of treaty power after this. They're not going to be present here in the treaty that wraps up the war. Um, this war is really not good for them for multiple reasons. Um, and we will see a heavy, heavy expansion westward in the aftermath of this war. So to come back over here, dramatic events that happen after America declares war in 1812 by the smallest margin of any declared war in U.S. history, by the way, that's worth noting. We try to invade Canada and we fail. Um, the Canadians and the British, they end up stacking D.C., burning down the White House in retaliation. The War of 1812 is characterized by just a few major battles and dramatic events. It's not this, you know... It's not the same kind of war as, for example, like World War II or even the Revolutionary War, where there's all these different battles that you should probably know. Um, the Battle of New Orleans is going to be a really, really big one to know, though. But before we talk about the Battle of New Orleans, we've got to talk about the treaty. And that might sound kind of weird, right? Like, the treaty is supposed to wrap things up. Well, the thing is, the Treaty of Ghent is signed in the summer of 1814. The Treaty of Ghent essentially retains pre-war boundaries. Um, there's not a lot of territory that changes hands. Because the British defeated Napoleon prior to the Treaty of Ghent, they don't have the need to impress American sailors anymore. So the treaty doesn't even really address impressment because there's no need for it anymore. Um, Britain has stopped needing our soldiers or our sailors, excuse me, to go fight against Napoleon. So the Treaty of Ghent doesn't even really mention impressment, and the Treaty of Ghent kind of retains pre-war borders. Britain just wants peace by the time that they've defeated, defeated Napoleon, is what we see. Um, so the Treaty of Ghent happens December of 1814. A couple weeks later, in January of 1815, the Battle of New Orleans happens. And I have $20 over here, um, just like I did over here. We're going to see General Andrew Jackson active over here as well. So Jackson has known that British soldiers, um, or British forces, excuse me, are sailing up into the Gulf and that they're going to be preparing to attack New Orleans. And so he's had time to prepare. They've dug into New Orleans. They've got what they need. Um, and it's just going to be an absolute massacre of British forces. And these poor British forces, they're fresh off a fight in this dude right here. They thought they were going to get to go home. And now instead they're being sent over here to um, America to just go and die in a bay somewhere. And so it, it is kind of sad when you look at it, but it's going to be absolutely staggering the amount of um, casualties that Americans are able to inflict. I think it's something like 2,700 British casualties killed, wounded. Um, Americans are going to have like 13 killed, and I think total it might be like 70 casualties. Um, we're going to have like, thir or excuse me, 13 killed, not 13 wounded. Um, and that is just an incredible margin of victory from the American perspective. And so at the same point in time as people hear about the treaty, they're also hearing about the Battle of New Orleans. Um, and of course, Andrew Jackson had no way of knowing the treaty was signed because technology was not at the point where you could hear about something two weeks after it happened. But Americans hear about all this kind of at the same point in time, and this just leads to an explosion of patriotic thought and sentiment. The thought here is awesome. Not only did we have this knock on fight, there's also a treaty. The war is over. We ended on a high note. We ended on a high note. We ended on a high note. Why would I have music drawn right there? Because we get a national anthem from this particular conflict. Our national anthem was written here during the War of 1812, um, Francis Scott Key. Um, you've probably heard a little bit about it in the media as of late. 
Um, there is a lot of debate nowadays as far as like, do we want to keep our national anthem? Um, really, the song of our nation, does it need to be about war like rockets red glare? Like, is that how we want our country immortalized? And some people say, yes, this is a formative moment in our history. This is American Revolution Part 2. And we've had it this way for so long at this point, it's more tradition than anything else. And other people say, maybe it's time to update that song to fit America now, not what America was. What America is now, not what America was, excuse me. Um, so, as always, I encourage you to make up your own mind, get informed. Um, that's not something anybody should ever tell you what to think about. Um, that's something you should make up for yourself. So, anyways, Battle of the New Orleans Treaty of Ghent um, is going to create this huge upswing in patriotism, and that's going to be bad for the Federalists. What I have right here is the Hartford Convention. So, Hartford Convention starts towards the end of 1814. Federalists were never in favor of this war. Federalists had a lot more close ties with British merchants. Federalists did not want to expand land out west. They did not really want any of these war efforts, even though there were some violations of sovereignty and impressment. What we see are that representatives from Federalist areas overwhelmingly vote against going to war here in the War of 1812. So they get together here at the Hartford Convention, and they've got a few things they discuss. They discuss how can we stop this from ever happening again? They discuss, do we need to change the Constitution? Do we need to even change, you know, should a president be limited to just maybe one term in office? Should the office of president rotate from state to state? Because we've had a lot of Virginian presidents up to this point in time, and they're not happy with that. Some of them even talk about seceding from the Union, because why would you want to be part of a nation that's going to go to war over a few thousand people impressed over a couple decades? And also, by the way, we just like want some territory. Like, is that a good reason to go to war? especially with Britain. And so they're incredibly unhappy the war happened in the first place. Throughout the carriage of the war, they see, oh, this is really not going so well. Um, however, events will conspire against the Federalists. After the Battle of New Orleans and the Treaty of Ghent, and after this huge upswing in patriotism that ends the war, the Federalists really just come out of this looking unpatriotic and out of touch. They don't look like true Americans. Okay? This is kind of the death blow to the Federalist Party. The final death blow, I would say, is when the National Republicans emerge. And so the National Republicans are represented here by, it might, I'm going to show you, okay. It's supposed to be a wolf in sheep's clothing, if you can see. Um, the beast beneath that is Federalist. So the National Republicans are going to assume some key policy positions of the Federalists, really taking away anybody's reason to be part of the Federalist Party in the first place. In particular, they're going to be okay with a national bank. Eventually, they're going to be more okay with like a national road system, infrastructure, things like that. Um, at this point in time, there's really no reason then for anyone to want to be a Federalist because they look unpatriotic, they look out of touch with reality, and if you care a lot about like a bank or about roads or something, the National Republicans are going to serve your interests, and you're not going to have a label that has the stench of Federalism with it. So we see the Federalist Party really no more after the War of 1812 for those reasons. Um, I think that might be it. I'm kind of taking a look at the board here to make sure that we've covered everything. Um, what we see happen here in the aftermath is this apparent era of political harmony. Um, we're going to see Monroe's presidency characterized as the era of good feelings. There is this, you know, apparent lack of political rancor and debate. Everybody is sort of on the same side as what people think. Of course, reality is a lot more complicated than that. And then we'll see the Monroe draft. I'm actually going to discuss that tomorrow in class. So that's the War of 1812. The big thing you should take out of it, again, is that this leads to an incredible upswing in patriotic sentiment. It really is the American Revolution Part Two because we've demonstrated our wealth as a nation. We've demonstrated our ability as a nation. We've demonstrated that we can declare war, we can go to war, and we can really come out um, none the worse for it, never mind that there wasn't a whole lot of things accomplished by it. Um, we didn't lose. A, <laughs> And we get an anthem out of it. So that's the War of 1812. Thank you so much for tuning in and for bearing with me. I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow morning. Thank you.